Um, our first talk for the session is uh, by Kenyon Bannon, and the title is Regimes of Ordering. Great, thanks. There we go. So here are some basic facts to sort of start the discussion. So we know that the relative orders of heads, specifiers, complements, and adjuncts seems to be highly constrained cross-linguistically when they don't move. So this is sort of a famous insight slash result from Jack and Doff, 1977, building on some work prior to him, encoded a next bar theory. Now, Tain, in a famous 1994 monograph, attempts to derive these results from a very restrictive theory of linear order, the linear correspondence axiom, and then depending on how you want to implement it following K, and this might be combined with a set of uh, uh, very simple and not particularly restrictive assumptions about possible phrase structures, so much less so than the classic X bar theory. But one of the results of this is that a base generated spec head comp structure may be linearized only in that order, with other orders being uh, derived through movements. So the idea is that asymmetric C command between elements maps directly to their linear order. If something asymmetrically C commands something else, then that thing precedes whatever it C commands. And I think this is something we should be excited about for at least the next 20 minutes or so. So for among other reasons if Kane's right, and the mapping from syntax to LF is relatively transparent, namely it also makes reference to asymmetric C command, then the linear order of constituents in a clause is a direct cue for their relative scope since linear order and scope are both derived but from the same uh, uh, underlying syntactic uh, relationship between elements. But if we take Kane seriously, we end up making bad predictions for scope in a number of languages. And that's sort of what this talk is about. So I'm gonna talk about some scope facts and word order facts in Tagalog and Japanese, which uh, considered all together, I think constitutes a puzzle and something that's worth talking about. And uh, one of the things I'm going to propose to, sort, to account for this puzzle is that the LCA is both right and wrong. Uh, the clause is sort of partitioned into two, but the LCA governed section of the clause always precedes the non-LCA governed section. Um, so the basic idea is going to, uh, and I'll give you a theory that does that. And then I'll give you some nice consequences that will capture a number of aforementioned distinctions between the two verb peripheral languages in a principled way. So here's the problem. So as I mentioned before, linear order and scope should tightly correlate given the LCA, um, since they both run off of the same underlying syntactic relationship. Uh, and the LCA requires more to be said to get the word in morpheme order uh, right in verb peripheral languages, uh, two worth considering are Japanese and Tagalog. So I'll start with Japanese since I think the problem is uh, more well known for the LCA wizards in the audience, this will sort of be a review. Uh, so the Japanese verb generally follows the uh, arguments and adjuncts construed with it. Uh, to account for this while maintaining the LCA, we need to propose a series of movement operations which reverse the order of a head and its complement. So when you have an argument hosted by a head uh, and then the head takes the you know, verb or something containing the verb as its complement, you need to do the following sort of thing to get the word order right. You need to flip the VP around uh, uh, the argument and then you need to flip the argument around the VP. And that will happily correctly account for the uh, relative order of morphemes in the Japanese verbal complex. Uh, and it turns out if you go through and you know, write this down on paper or something like that, uh, if you iterate one, uh, you end up maintaining the relative scope of arguments with respect to each other, but you alter the relative scope of arguments with respect to the heads in the verbal complex. And what this leads you to expect basically is that precedent should Map directly to scope in Japanese. If something precedes something else, it should outscope it. And so as mentioned before, it's a verb final language with relatively free order of arguments. Um, as we see in 2A and 2B with a simple transitive clause, you can flip the object in front of the subject. Both word orders are acceptable. And the relative order of arguments does determine their scope. So I'm using variable binding by a quantifier here as a diagnostic. The object uh, can't into the subject in 3A unless you flip their order around as in 3B. Uh, and 
this makes the wrong predictions for negation, however. So when you uh, force the object to remain in its lowest LCA respecting position by marking it with contrast of laws and four, the object has to scope below negation. I'm doing this with a theme here to uh, allow me to draw a nice parallel with some Tagalog facts in a bit, but you can play the same trick with subjects and the problem is basically the same. Uh, the subject precedes negation and should not scope below it. So here's Tagalog. So the Tagalog verb generally precedes its arguments, but unfortunately much of the Tagalog verbal complex seems to be prefixal. Uh, so this is uh, unfortunate if we wish to maintain the LCA since it requires head movement of X to Y to result in X preceding Y. And this is mentioned uh, briefly in K94. Um, so for any span of prefixes or heads that start below an argument in a verb initial language, uh, with uh, uh, the following derivational steps will need to take place. You will uh, start out with the argument and the specifier of some phrase projected by a particular head. You pop the argument out of the specifier out of that position and then you flip the verbal complex around it. And that gets you the uh, um, that, that gets you the right order. And again, if you iterate this, you expect the relative scope of arguments to be preserved and then the verbal complex to either outscope all of the arguments or per scope to be underdetermined depending on exactly how you wanna treat these verbal complexes. So considered as a pair, Tagalog is sort of the inverse of Japanese. It's a head initial prefixing language that also has relatively free order of arguments as we see in 6a and 6b. Uh, you can uh, you can, you can, you can uh, flip the relative order of these things around. So here the LCA makes the right prediction for scope and the relative order of negation and theme as we see in 7a, uh, uh, a theme can't outscope negation if it uh, follows negation, but if it precedes negation, uh, the theme outscopes negation. So it ends up making the wrong prediction for scope and the relative order of arguments. However, although see the talk following me for some potentially conflicting evidence. So as we see in 8a, uh, a theme can't bind into an agent even when it precedes it. So this contrasts with Japanese. So what we see then is that the LCA sort of partially succeeds and partially fails in a kind of interestingly systematic way. Uh, it makes the right predictions for the relative scope of two arguments in Japanese and for the relative scope of negation and theme in Tagalog, but the wrong predictions for the relative scope of two arguments in Tagalog and for the relative scope of negation and theme in Japanese. So what do we do? So one thing we could do uh, faced with these challenges would be to reject the LCA wholesale. Uh, this would be sort of a sad result since there are a lot of cases where it does, where the asymmetric C command between elements does seem to determine the relative order of constituents. And it might be a sad result since, say, since, since this would be a rejection of the X-bar theorems that the LCA delivers, leading us to either want to rederive them or rederive the parts of them that we want to keep. And it might also be a sad result since if the LCA is, is correct, uh, the null hypothesis for any understudied language is that precedence between two constituents can be taken as an argument for a particular phrase structure, particularly if we uh, 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 restrict ourselves or prefer relatively simple derivations. So this is nice as a sort of starting hypothesis for the working analyst, and I think it's nicer for the sort of, sort of learner as analyst metaphor for language acquisition. I think more narrowly bringing it back to the facts I've introduced, we would want a systematic explanation for this sort of uh, distinction between Japanese and Tagalog, which would capture why the LCA seems to be correct and incorrect in a complementary way for the two languages, given what we know about the relative scope of arguments in these languages. So here's a way of doing this. The idea will be that the LCA is right for portions of the clause, but wrong for others. Uh, the differences between uh, Japanese and Tagalog reflect which portions of the clause the LCA is right and wrong for in the respective languages. Uh, with the sort of mode of force behind this being the idea that there are other conditions on the mapping of syntax to linear order uh, that might come into conflict with the LCA. And in these cases, you have to use another uh, algorithm to uh, establish a total linear order between the elements in your clause. So here is a way uh, not to be linearized. I'll call it exit. Uh, what it does is it marks some element as being ignored by the LCA. So maybe 
the el if this element is complex, the order of the elements within that complex element might be determined by the LCA, but uh, that element and maybe stuff within it, uh, uh, the its linear order is not determined by the LCA with respect to elements outside it. One thing that might motivate an element to exit would be a requirement like 10. It's a requirement that certain heads be in a, in a selectional relationship, be adjacent, so following Norbin and following uh, some of Boblik's work in the mid 90s. Uh, what this basically says is if two heads are linearized and are in a uh, 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 selectional relationship of some sort, uh, they have to be adjacent. That conditional will be handy in a bit. So it's important for elements to be linearized and pronounced, at least when they're not uh, recoverable from the context. And something like 11 will make sure that everything that is pronounced is done so with a uh, sort of linear order. So we'll call it re-entry, sort of following up on the exit metaphor. The idea is that unordered, what, what this does is it says, uh, you take your elements whose uh, order has not yet been determined and sort of tack them on after previously ordered elements. So, you, so once you've linearized a portion of your clause with the LCA, you sort of append everything that could not be linearized after it. So this is going to partition the clause into two. You'll have your LCA governed part and your not LCA governed part. And sort of in generalization that we want to capture terms, what this gets you is that elements for which the linear order scope correspondence breaks down uh, in the way I described earlier, uh, always follow elements for which it holds. So the LCA governed part of the clause is that part of the clause where linear order is determined by C command and so is scope. There's a second part where scope is presumably determined by C command as well, but the linear order is not. So that's, that gets you the sort of uh, distinction between these two parts of the clause in terms of uh, uh, how linear order and scope either come together or don't. So this will go a ways to preserving some, some of the good parts of the LCA, maybe for other languages in particular, while allowing us to account for Japanese and Tagalog. So here's how this is going to work. So there's this one linearly contiguous part of the clause where the relative order of elements is determined by the LCA. Elements in this portion have their scope fixed with respect to each other, determined uh, by a set of you know, asymmetric C command relationships. And this is reflected through the LCA and their linear order. There's another part of the clause where the relative order of elements is not determined by the LCA and the scope of elements in the latter part is not directly related to their linear order. So here's how this works for uh, Japanese and Tagalog. So the basic idea is going to be that the same, the same problem for this adjacency requirement arises in both languages, uh, but they have different ways of solving, uh, solving this problem. And this will cause different elements in the clause to appear in the two sections of the clause that I've just mentioned. So let's start with Japanese. So consider a clause structure like that in 14 in Japanese. Uh, if you apply the LCA straightforwardly to everything in the clause, you, this would result in a selectional adjacency violation. I'm assuming that the object pops up a little higher. Maybe this is for case licensing purposes. Uh, maybe this is because it's introduced there following some recent work by people at uh, the University of Arizona, who I think are, have built on some suggestions in the literature beforehand. But the basic idea is that, you know, the object prevents, you know, the verb from being adjacent to little b or maybe some nearby low functional head. And the agent would furthermore prevent little b from being adjacent to t if you were to apply the LCA to the whole clause as shown here. So what you do instead is you apply exit to each element in the clausal spine. And this prevents the problem from arising. So nothing intervenes between the selecting elements because they aren't linearized. So this is where the conditional that I mentioned before sort of comes in handy. What you do then is uh, we need, you still need to pronounce these things. Their linear order seems still needs to be determined. So you apply reentry to all of the elements in the verbal complex. And that forces these elements to be linearized to the right of all of these arguments. And then perhaps selectional adjacency will force the verbal complex to be linearized together in a particular order. Uh, the order of elements to the left of the verb, namely the arguments will be determined by the LCA since there's nothing motivating their exit. So that gets you the distinction between uh, uh, 
Right, so since the elements preceding the verb haven't undergone exit, their order is determined by the LCA, so you get a sort of tight connection between their linear order and their relative scope. The relative order of negation and arguments is not determined by the LCA, so this accounts in part for the relative flexibility of their scope with respect to each other. And then I can talk more and show you Appendix 1 to show you more technical details on how we might uh, get the flexible scope of negation in Japanese in contrast to Tagalog, while still tying this to the fact that the verbal complex is subject to exit in this way. So suppose a similar clause structure for Tagalog. Uh, if you apply the LCA, the same problem will arise. The object uh, causes the same problem as does the subject. And so the idea is that in Tagalog, you apply exit to the phrasal arguments between the heads on the causal spine. And this is another way of solving the same problem. So the absence of you know, linearization statements for these problematic phrases uh, solves the problem for selectional adjacency. All of the heads in the verbal complex are adjacent. And then reentry will force arguments and you know, adjuncts perhaps to be linearized to the right of the verbal complex with nothing in particular forcing these arguments to be linearized in any particular order. So the, the order of uh, elements following the verb in Tagalog is not determined by the LCA, so their linear order need not reflect their relative scope. Presumably it's determined by you know, the base position that they occupy in the clause, at least for the agent voice uh, clauses under discussion here. Negation proceeds and the C commands the underlying structural position of the arguments and therefore scopes above them. And then, as I mentioned before, if you move an argument above negation, uh, uh, removing the motivation to target it for exit, this makes it subject to, LC, to the LCA, ensuring a tight relationship between the linear order of these elements and their, uh, and, and their relative scope. So here's a different sort of evidence that I'll go through sort of quickly involving uh, evidence from PF. So scrambling in the two languages behaves differently for stress. So in Japanese, uh, scrambling affects nuclear stress assignment. So nuclear stress falls on the object in an SOV clause, but on the subject in an OSV clause. Uh, in Tagalog, according to some work by Norvin, uh, scrambling doesn't have an effect on nuclear stress. So in agent voice clauses, when you control for a number of factors, the theme in a particular position is always more prominent than the agent would be in that position. So, and this is supposed to reflect nuclear stress assignment. So there's a lot of work which suggests that the uh, relative prominence of elements in a clause is determined by their position in the syntactic structure, that nuclear stress is uh, 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 assigned by some sort of structure sensitive rule, and the distinction between the two types of scrambling in terms of whether they have an effect or on stress or not falls out straightforwardly for any such theory of stress assignment in the theory I've discussed here. So Japanese scrambling word order alternations reflect distinct syntactic structures, which the rules for nuclear stress assignment interpret differently. Tagalog scrambling alternations reflect a singular syntactic structure, which can only be interpreted by the rules of nuclear stress assignment in one particular way. So, what we've seen are some problems for an attempt to derive uh, X-bar theory for more general principles, namely the LCA. So scope is a diagnostic for C command, diagnosis the wrong C command relationships for certain linear orders if we take the LCA seriously. So the theory developed here uh, ends up being an argument for the LCA, albeit in a weakened form. Um, Sort of as implicitly presented here, the LCA is part of a process of linearization which operates on the output of the syntax rather than something which uh, uh, constrains possible derivational steps in the syntax per Kane's original formulation. And this falls in line with a number of similar proposals about the LCA. So this is suggested in Chomsky 95 and Morrow 2000. Uh, and uh, more recent critiques of the LCA note that this LCA's algorithm approach escapes a number of the problems that befall this stricter formulation from Kane uh, 94. So sort of leaving this with a uh, possible avenue for future work, uh, a perhaps more interesting approach would be to maintain Kane's original formulation of the LCA as a condition on admissible syntactic structures. Uh, and, but sort of following the idea here, the idea would be that structure which the LCA can't linearize might ultimately be 
pronounceable on par with the unlinearizable structures discussed here. Uh, and this might be diagnosed by a sort of similar disconnect between the scope properties and the linear order of the structures in question. Thanks. All right, thank you. Um, so the chat should now be open uh, for questions. If you have a question, please indicate so in the chat uh, and I'll call, I'll call on you. Um, we have a question from Copa. Please unmute yourself. Yeah, this is really cool. I mean, it, I, I think it, this actually works super well for Fijian. Uh, I've always been very, which clearly has this like domain where everything is ordered in a sensible way and then like VOS, VSO, VOSPP, you can get like all sorts of different orders and it doesn't seem to affect anything. I've not been able to figure anything out with regards to that. So, uh, so it, has, it, it, it similarly lacks like a, it doesn't feed variable binding of any, in, in any way it seems to be determined by where you would probably expect their thematic positions to be in the structure. It's very free. Like, it's just, you can get lots of different, it, it doesn't, I mean, there's some preferences for VOS, but it's, uh, I mean, anyway, we can talk oh. about that. What I wanted to ask about was actually something different. Okay. Um, so sure. I really, so I really, I really like this idea of there being different domains of the clause. I wondered if you thought about yeah. Germanic verb clusters uh, in this connection, because it seems to have, uh, it looks at first glance very similar to Japanese, but what's very interesting is that there's this work by on uh, mm -hmm. PP ordering. And what you actually get is, you know, like in Japanese, before the sort of verb cluster area, the verb, the head mm -hmm. verb final verb cluster area, you know, scope is left to right, basically. Then you get the verb cluster with all sorts of problematic things. But then after that, you also get a, a sensibly ordered domain where if you put prepositional phrases mm -hmm. after the verb cluster, they mirror the prepositional phrases before. So um, there's some, yeah, there's some good yeah. work from Alton Aleman that summarizes this, but they seem to, where he says they have left attachment, right attachment, but they really seem to mirror each other, so. that That's interesting. Do you know, are, are there scope facts for, like, like are there scope and variable binding facts in the Neil Aleman paper? Is that something? Yeah, there's a, well, there's a recent paper by him and Hans von der Kote on that stuff. And that actually gets more complicated in a way that cool. maybe you could exploit where it does seem like you can variable bind in a fairly surfacey way, uh, even though the scope, even though the order of PP attachment is the mirror, so. Um, that's, that's, that's interesting, thanks, yeah. Yeah, you should definitely look at that. Cool. All right, um, we have a question from Matt Pearson. Hi. Um, yeah. Uh, thanks. This was a really interesting talk. Um, uh, first, uh, uh, a quick comment and then, and then a question. So one nice thing that I think falls out from this story is that uh, you get this asymmetry between Japanese and Tagalog in terms of um, the uh, ordering restrictions on the part that gets shoved to the end, right? So in yeah. the Japanese verb complex, everything is fully ordered, you know, you get mirror principle uh, uh, effects uh, because pr presumably because of the selectional relations among the heads. Whereas mm -hmm. when you're sort of shoving all of the arguments to the right, like in Tagalog, you get a lot more variation in word order, right? Uh, and that seems to be, you know, largely true for verb initial languages that it's, there's, there's kind of a free for all or, you know, maybe non grammatical things that determine the order of elements following the verb. Mm -hmm. um, but you do also get evidence, and this is sort of where the question comes, you also do get evidence for, for relative scope, um, for a relationship between scope and linear order for things after mm -hmm. the verb complex in some verb initial languages. Um, so there's, there's um, Rakowski's old work on um, adverb order in, um, in Malagasy, for instance, where when yeah. you have two two adverbs that follow the verb, the 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 one further away from the verb has to scope over the one closer to the verb. So you get evidence for a kind of roll up structure. So yeah. um, I'm wondering how we would capture these kinds of roll up effects in in your story. What would be determining um, 
um, uh, phenomena where you get a, a you seem to get a mirror image relationship between scope and linear order after the verb. After the yeah, um, so I think there are two possible answers for this. So um, one would be that for the Malagasy cases, um, you are doing roll-up movement. Um, so the bit of so so there is a, there's still a portion of the clause that for which the LCA is right. It's you know that bit of the clause for which you do roll-up movement, and uh -huh. then there's also this. And, and then maybe you kick out, you know, the arguments and stuff, the stuff that's freely ordered to a position after that, right? It would be extending the domain of the, you know, it would be ex extending that sort of LCA compliant domain a little bit past the verb, sort of in, a, in terms of a generalization. Uh, another possibility would be to tie this, and this would need maybe closer investigation to facts about the scope of uh, post-verbal and post-object um, adjuncts in English. So the discussion on the, the the discussion in the literature seems to suggest that you get similar facts uh, where your rightmost adjunct might scope over your leftmost one, which I, which is consistent with what you described for the Malagasy case, right? right. Yeah. Um, but there's been more work on this, so. Um, Colin Phillips mentions this in his dissertation, and there's a uh, Li Squibb, who the author whose name of which I'm blanking on, um, who notes that the this is descriptively true, but if you mess around with like which of these adjuncts is assigned focal stress or something like that, um, uh -huh. you can flip the scope of the arguments around, and if you have like three of them three scope taking adjuncts, which apparently some people have judgments on, whichever is focused um, is the one which, you know, outscopes the other two. Uh -huh. uh, bringing this back to the Malagasy case, it would be interesting to see if you get a similar effect there. If, um, you know, the elements in that chunk really do have their scope uh, determined strictly by the LCA through the roll-up movement analysis, or if they're sort of like the English post-verbal adjuncts where whatever it is that's determining uh, their relative scope, it's not, uh, it's possibly not their position in the syntactic structure or the mapping uh -huh. is not so straightforward. Uh -huh. Yeah, worth looking into. Thanks. Thanks. Um, we have a question from Dan Bronkin. You could unmute yourself. Yeah, thanks a bunch, Kenyon. Really interesting talk. So I have a question about exit specifically in the context where it applies, um, mm -hmm. and more specifically about the relationship between exit and um, Norvin's concept of Hippocratic altruism. Mm -hmm. Right. So as far as I understand it in continuity theory, there's this principle Hippocratic altruism, which says when two heads are in a selectional relationship, things cannot freely evacuate from positions in between them to allow them to be adjacent. Right. So if A and B, if A and C are here, and then there's a B in between that mm -hmm. disrupts it, E can't just yep. like move off to make, right? Um, but it seems like that's the context exactly in which exit applies, correct? Yep, you're, um, but you're not, you're not solving it, you're not solving it through syntactic means, right? You're solving it through PFE means or more specifically by neglecting them at least for a bit at PF uh, to avoid creating the problem. And then, you know, yeah, this creates another problem, but then you have a way of going on to solve that. I see, I see. Do you want to elaborate on what what those means are by which this happens at PF? Uh, I mean, I mean, you're 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 flagging these things as being you know irrelevant for the LCA. Um, you're not moving them around, right? You're 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 using PF means to solve the PF problem, not syntactic means to solve the PF problem. I see. Thanks. If uh, no one has any other any question, I actually um, like to ask a question. Um, so I'm looking at uh, the, I guess it's Tagalog specific. Um, I'm looking at the, I guess slide 16, um, and I'm sort of at the uh, scope facts, and I sort of, um, mm -hmm. I kind of 
try to avoid looking at these facts uh, too, for too long because they sort of give me a little mm. bit of a headache, but in Tagalog particularly. But I sort of have this intuition that I'm not sure is reported, but I, uh, there seems to be like in, in, so you have these AV examples here, but I think in yeah. TV, at least for me, there is a sort mm -hmm. of a, a A linear order requirement in terms of uh, what, how you do, how do, you, how you do the the binder and the variable. In, yeah. Um, so, so in the Rakowski dissertation, there's a footnote which suggests that there does seem to be a linear order preference, uh, and I th I think similar facts for PV are noted as well. That um, it's at least in some cases possible for. Uh, the theme in a PV voice to bind into an agent. I guess I wonder kind of how you might, uh, how that would be different from like a, a case where, you know, the order doesn't matter. Right. So, 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 hmm. uh-huh, uh-huh. Yes, that would be a puzzle for me. I think the right answer would be or a possible right answer would be that you create you create the right structure to allow variable binding, and it's really just this linear order requirement that, you know, I don't I don't know exactly where that comes from, but that's what's responsible for 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 the goodness or badness of these sentences. 